This is Steve Lalkenday. This is Ann Lalkenday. This is Governor Staten. This is David Hodnotsery. This is Professor Gregory Smith, and I give you Jackson, Jackson Snyder, Snyder Presents. Presents. And you're listening to Jackson Snyder Prevents. And I'll keep an eye out uh, peeling onions, so we you know, keep it here. Hey, uh. okay, will it light up? No, don't touch it anymore. Being back with you tonight. Bless your heart for showing up for Jackson Snyder Presents. But I have to warn you, this story constitutes very controversial and speculative matter concerning two first century characters well known in their day and well known in ours. They were in love. At least he was in love with her. And had he married her, the world today would be vastly different than it is. Vastly worse. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about the Apostle Paul and Popea Sabina. You might not have heard of her, but in the era that Paul lived, everybody knew who she was because she was Emperor Nero's second wife. <laughs> Paul loves Popea. Let's connect some dots. Unless, of course, your faith isn't strong enough to deal with this particular matter. Look, I don't want to get a bunch of complaints going into the Hebrew Nation radio office. This is a Hebrew Nation original program. So if you're easily upset, go back to jspresents.org tonight, pick you up some kitty shows out there, and listen to them, and you won't be the least bit challenged. But if you go on to listen to this, I don't want you getting mad at me. I'm only speculating here. I'm trying to put some meat on the bones of Paul. Shouldn't we be doing that? Shouldn't we learn as much as we can, not only about what these fellows in the New Testament wrote, but about how they live, too? And there's a lot of information out there about Paul, especially. He was a famous character, and famous in his own time, especially with the imperial government of Rome. You already know this if you've been listening to my podcast lately, but this one is a little different, and I warned you, if I get one more phone call from Hebrew Nation Radio about somebody complaining about the show, well, I'm going to have to send someone down to your house. You hear me? Really, it'd be better that you just don't listen than that you get mad or disappointed with me. Hey, I'm only the messenger here. And besides that, I love Paul. But he's got to have some muscles and sinews. I want to know what he looks like. I want to know where he went. I want to know who he loved, who were his friends. And I found a lot of his friends already. Historical people, famous people. And if you would listen to this whole series, you would find out about some of these famous people. And you would realize, that our Apostle Paul wasn't just some poor old coonskinner out there, but that he was a powerful man of distinction from a royal family with imperial ties, and that he was also a man in love. Oh, I wish I was in love. But no, I sit in this lonely room night after night trying to entertain you with something new, something you never heard before. No, we're not going to talk about the feasts anymore. No, we're not going to talk about the calendar. I'm done with that. No, we're not going to give the same old Midrash hash, the same old Torah portion over and over. If you don't have that, what have you? Let's go on to bigger and better things. Leave the elemental stuff behind. Come with me and climb. We'll take a journey to the center of the mind. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! <laughs> Paul loves Popea, the story of heartbreak, lost love, some very influential people that may have affected the entire world for the last 2,000 years. 
And tonight we're going to speculate regarding Paul and Popea, a wild speculation, one I probably will not put on the radio. Sometimes you never know how these assays are going to turn out, and this is certainly one of those. We're going to start by investigating the claims of the Ebionites, claims that are recorded in Epiphanius Panarian, his medicine chest of heresies. He has nothing good to say about the Ebionites. In fact, he devotes about 31 pages talking about their wild schemes, how wrong they are, how they led people astray, and how they've made up all kinds of derisive stories about Paul or, as Epiphanius says, St. Paul. Nor are the Ebionites ashamed to accuse Paul here with certain fabrications of their false apostles' villainy and imposture. They say that he was Tarsian, which he admits himself and doesn't deny. And they suppose that he was of Greek parentage, taking the occasion for this from the same passage because of his frank statement, I am a man of Tarsus, a citizen of no mean city. They then claim that he was Greek and the son of a Greek mother and a Greek father, but that he had gone up to Jerusalem, stayed there for a while, desired to marry a daughter of the high priest, and had therefore become a proselyte and had been circumcised. But since he still couldn't marry that sort of girl because he became angry and he wrote against circumcision and against the Sabbath and all Torah legislation. That's the claim of the Ebionites, according to Panarian. And uh, some of that certainly is right, and some of it certainly is wrong. But it's on those statements that I want to take off from. And to finish this up, I'll, I'll speculate as to really what happened between Paul and Popea. But first we go to the Acts of the Apostles, 8, 1. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the Ecclesia in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. This according to the writer of the Acts. Maybe maybe it's Epaphroditus. Let's jump up one chapter to Acts 9.9. 9. We find another such claim, but Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the master, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Listen to some of this language the writer of Acts uses. Murder, breathing threats, as though fire gushed out of his nostril. We're well aware of the report from the Nazarene Acts as well, which I'll read a little bit of in chapter 70. I've read it 50 times probably. And when matters were at that point that they should come and be immersed, that is the prophet, proselytes on the Jerusalem steps, some one of our enemies, entering the Hekel with a few men, began to cry out. He said, What mean you, O men of Israel? Why are you so easily hurt on? Why are you led headlong by the most miserable men who are deceived by Simon, a magician, while he was thus speaking, and adding more to the same effect? And while Yaakov the Mavakar was refuting him, he began to excite the people and to raise a tumult so that the people might not be able to hear what was said. Therefore, he began to drive all into confusion with shouting and to undo what had been arranged with much labor and at the same time to reproach the Kohanim and to enrage them with revilings and abuse and like a madman to excite everyone to murder, saying, what do you? Skip down just a little bit to chapter 71. Then after three days, one of the brothers came to us from Gamaliel, who we mentioned before, bringing to us secret tidings that that enemy had received a commission from Caiaphas, the Kohen Haggadol, that he should arrest all who believed in Yeshua and should go to Damashek with his letters, and that there also, employing the help of unbelievers, he should make havoc among the faith, and that he was hastening to Damashek chiefly on this account, because he believed that Kipha had fled there. Strong language. We consider that Acts of the Apostles and the Nazarene Acts, according to scholars, use the same sources, but the stories came out different. And I kind of wonder, why, if Paul's a Pharisee of the Pharisees, I mean him no dishonor, what is he doing being employed by the high priest? They were famous enemies. 
the Pharisees and the priests. Down through their history together, there had been pogroms one against the other, even to the point of massacres. So they did not get along at all. But Paul goes to the high priest, Caiaphas, for those letters. Why? Then we'll hear from Josephus and his opinion of Saul and his gang. Josephus says a sedition arose between the high priests with regard to one another. For they got there together bodies of the boldest sort of people, and frequently came from reproaches to throwing of stones at each other. But Ananias was too hard for the rest by his riches, which enabled him to gain those who were most ready to receive. Costobarus also, and Saulus, did themselves get together a multitude of wicked wretches. And this because they were of the royal family. They were Herodians. And so they obtained favor among them because of their kindred to Agrippa. But still they used violence with the people and were very ready to plunder those that were weaker than themselves. There are three, four confessions right there in regard regarding to the historical Saul or Paul. So we understand, though in the Nazarene Acts, he's not named, he's just called an enemy. We even have the testimony of Josephus, who of course would be on the side of the high priests. And remember, in the Nazarene Acts, it says that they were throwing stones at each other. The high priest was specifically named there. Then we look to his own confessions. Galatians 1.13 For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age, among my traditions of my fathers. I was so extremely jealous for the traditions. But when he who had set me apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away to Arabia, and then returned again to Damascus. Didn't he spend three years in Arabia? I speculate, why did he go to Arabia? That's always a big question. But if he was a kinsman of Agrippa and Herodian and Aristobulus, as he says in his own words, that would be home for him in Idumea, because that's where the Herods were from. The Herods did not favor the priests nor the Pharisees. The Herods favored the Essenes, because we are told that when Herod the Great's father was seeking office in Rome, that an Essene came to him and gave him a prophecy that he would not only succeed, but that he would see his kin sitting on the throne of Israel. So the Herods always gave the Essenes a favor just because of that old prophecy. And we go to Philippians 3.3. 3. Paul is saying, we are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Jesus Christos and put no confidence in the flesh. Though well, I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrew, as to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness, based on the law and faultless. Sometimes when I bring that up, I hear uh, it said, well, that was before his conversion. Could be. Josephus seems to indicate that before his conversion, he was that way. And then after his conversion, when he was raising up gangs in the late 60s to shake down these Nazarenes or Ebionites, whoever they happened to be. Let me introduce one other person into this mix, Joseph Caiaphas, Paul's high priest, the one he applied to. Joseph Caiaphas in the New Testament was the Jewish high priest who is said to have organized the plot to kill Yeshua. Caiaphas is also said to have been involved in the Sanhedrin trial of Yeshua. The primary source for Caiaphas' life is the New Testament and also the writings of Josephus. 18-year tenure as high priest. This suggests that Caiaphas had a really good working relationship with the Roman authorities, and surely he had. Caiaphas was the son-in-law of Annas by marriage to his daughter. Annas, we remember he's mentioned in the gospel accounts of the birth of Yeshua as a marker for time as to who the high priest was when Yeshua was born. Annas had four other sons that all took the high priesthood, and Caiaphas got the high priesthood by marrying the daughter of Annas. For Jewish leaders of that time, there were serious concerns about Roman rule and the insurgency of the Zealot movement. 
which tried to eject the Romans from Israel entirely. The Romans wouldn't perform execution over violations of the Halakha, and therefore the charge of blasphemy, blasphemy, that wouldn't have mattered to Pilate, and evidently it didn't from the New Testament uh, notion of the trial. Caiaphas' legal position, therefore, was to establish that Yeshua was not was guilty not of blasphemy, but also of proclaiming himself to be Moshiach, which was understood to be the return of the Davidic dynasty. This would have been an act of sedition, not only against the Herods, but also against Roman rule. And regarding the high priests, they would lose everything if a Davidic king would come back. And it looks as though they took this very seriously too. And the New Testament writers serious enough to place within their writings the genealogy of Yahshua that shows him to be a son of Zadok and a son of David. Now, Israeli scholars, they've confirmed the authenticity of a 2,000-year-old burial ossuary. We remember what an ossuary is. It's for the second second burying of Jewish people in the first century only, if they had any money. They would lay a corpse out inside of a cave or a mausoleum for a year until the flesh separated from the bones. Then the second burial would come to pass where the bones were collected up and put in a rectangular stone box. Thus, we have the ossuary. In some cases, when those stone boxes have been found, and there are literally thousands that have been found, sometimes they would actually inscribe the name on the outside of that ossuary. It would be scratched in, or in some cases, it would be highly decorative and uh, done by an expert. So here we have the tomb of the Caiaphas family has been found and not long ago, just a matter of a few years ago. And one of those ossuaries is inscribed with these words, Mary, daughter of Yeshua, son of Caiaphas, priest of Maaziah from Beit Imri. So what we're finding there in that Caiaphas tomb, besides his own tomb and ossuary, is the ossuary of at least one daughter, her name being Miriam, who was married to another priest, the priest named Yeshua, the son of Caiaphas. So we've got, let's see, that would be a daughter-in-law, or that would be a granddaughter. So we're getting close as we're looking for a daughter of the high priest that maybe Paul was deeply in love with. Uh, we shall see. And here this pops out of the ground in the winter of 1990. There, there was some work done in the Peace Force there in Israel. In Hebrew, the place was known as the Tayelet. Tayelet. Workers discovered this burial cave made of uh, with up to four recesses. Those recesses within the tomb are called loculi. Literally, literally that means places dug out in the sides of the tomb. Rectangular spaces about six feet deep and one or two feet wide cut in the limestone bedrock. You see these quite often when you go on a tour of Israel or Jerusalem. And uh, there, there have literally been hundreds of these found with all kinds of names, and many of them recognize them, like Caiaphas, somebody we've heard of. Inside the Caiaphas family tomb, there are 12 ossuaries. Six were just scattered about the tomb, and I made it obvious that the tomb had been robbed in antiquity sometime, but the robbers left six in their original places. It was identified as a second temple burial tomb, and the only time that they used ossuaries was in the first century AD. So finding that dates it right there to the time that we're concerned with. But it was only for those that could afford a family tomb. You remember Yahshua was purportedly buried in uh, a buried tomb, as the Baptist preacher always says. The second burial was what's referred to in Judaism as being gathered up with one's forefathers. And the custom is, of course, after that first year to have everybody come in and visit the grave and put the bones in and make that part of the traditions. Of the five ossuaries with inscriptions in there, there are actually two women named, and one is Miriam, who I mentioned before, and the other is Shalom Zion, Shalom Zion, Shalom Zion, a very 
common name at that time. There's one of those ossuaries that is uh, uh, beautifully decorated with rare and intricate patterns, two, two circle patterns, each made up of six whorl rosettes bordered by a pattern of palm branches. The picture of the this one is easily found on the internet by popping into a search engine, Caiaphas Ossuary. So inside those ossuaries were found the bones of six different people, two infants, a child between the ages two and five, a young boy between 13 and 18, and an adult woman and a male of about 60. There's also a coin found in there, minted by Herod Agrippa, who served seven years as king before he was eaten with worms. That helps us all the more to date the Caiaphas ossuaries to the early first century through the first half. The evidence seems to suggest that we may have uncovered the burial box and even more of the bones of the high priest Caiaphas, who handed Yahshua over to the Romans. Now the main person I want to talk about tonight is Popea. See if you get to know her. I'm going to put a picture or two up. This is from the motion picture Quo Vadis. We have this Popea, purportedly a daughter of the high priest, perhaps even the very high priestess that Epiphanius tells us that Paul was in love with. You think Paul could be in love? Of course he could. Here's Popea on the left and Peter Ustinov as Nero on the right. This movie is worth watching. I've said this a lot of times. I don't know if anybody ever has or not, but for a mere $2.99, you can go out to Amazon right now and rent it and watch it. Two and a half hours long, worth every bit of it if you're interested in origin, Hebrew roots, origins of Christianity. Yes, Paul's in there, Peter's in there, Nero's in there, Popeye's in there, Marcus Vinicius is in there, you ladies, this is played by Robert Taylor, a heartthrob 60 years ago. I probably never heard of it. Deborah Kerr is also in there. She plays Lydia. Remember the Lydia uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, the seller of purple? And this portrait is actually Popea Sabina herself, known throughout the Roman world as one of the most beautiful women in the world. I can't actually see it, but then I like ugly girls. I'd be lucky to find any girl, to tell you the truth. Popea Sabina. She was the mistress and the second wife of Roman Emperor Nero, Domitian Ahenobarbus. Nero's bad acts, they're often attributed in the historical records to her influence. Uh, I don't know when she was born, but she died in 65 CE. That's an important date, 65 CE, one year into the persecution, the Neuronic persecution of believers. One year in. She was born the daughter of a woman with the same name, her mother, Popea Sabina the Elder, committed suicide. Her father was a fellow named Titus Olius. Her paternal grandfather, Popeus Sabinus, it's the male uh, spelling, was a Roman consul and the friend of several emperors. Her family was evidently wealthy, and Popea herself owned a villa outside Pompeii. Popea was first married to Rufus Crispinus. He was in the Praetorian Guard, the emperor's special army, and her and Rufrius had a son. Agrippina the Younger, whom I've talked about in other programs, who was the wife of the Emperor Claudius and the mother of Emperor Nero, she removed Rufius Crispinus, the Praetorian Guard, from his place because he was too close to the previous Empress, Mesalina. We, in the previous segment, had compared Mesalina with the Whore of Babylon, a very famous, not only royal, being married to Claudius, but she was also famous as a profligate when Claudius was away. We'll go into that again, it's just too sordid. But Mesalina also took care of Claudius. When she got back, he got back by feeding him a poison mushroom. Popea's next husband was Otho. He was a childhood friend of Nero. They were very close. They were always engaged in the same perversions. Otho would go on after Nero's death, death to be a very briefly emperor right after him. But when they were married, Popea and Otho 
Popeia at the same time became the mistress of the Emperor Nero. And it may be that she just married Otho, who was a governor of uh, Lusitania, Portugal. She may have just married him to get closer to Nero. Is this woman well known in the ancient world and also one that was well known for, I guess you'd say, sleeping her way up the ladder. She was an actress. She may well have originated right there in Jerusalem. There is some um, evidence toward that, which I'll get into in a minute. So Nero divorced his wife, Octavia, who was a decent person. She was the daughter of Claudius that would make them cousins. <clears throat> and this divorce made a rift with his mother, that I mentioned before, Agrippina the Younger, a very controlling woman, another one that slept her way up to the emperorship, Nero's mother, whom you might remember, she really wanted to take over the emp empire when Nero got in. And she was already the empress married to Claudius as well. <clears throat> so she was very scheming. And finally, Nero did away with her. He built her a boat for her birthday. It's one of those nice float boats with a uh, shade over the top of it, except the shade was made out of lead, plate lead, and was rigged up so that when she got out a little ways off the shore, that roof of that shade would come down upon her and kill her. Well, it didn't quite work, work right. It killed her handmaiden, but Agrippina escaped, swam her way up to the bank. There she was awaited by some of Nero's freedmen, who then stabbed her to death. But this is not unusual for this time and place. Think it's violent here? If they would have had machine guns at that time in Rome, there would be nobody left today. So Nero then married Popeia, and Popeia was given the high title of Augusta, female form of Augustus, which means generous one. It was um, a name just given to the highest people, and tribute came with that, and money came with that name, and fame all over. Woman just didn't have that name since Augustus was emperor, and his wife Livia was given that name. So Nero divorced his wife, married Popea, and then sent his wife off to Pandaterra, Pandateria, an island where royals would send people they didn't want there to starve. And finally, instead of waiting for her to die, he sent some people over there from the Praetorian Guard to stab her to death as well, so he could remarry. They had a little daughter, get this name, Claudia. We just keep running into these same names from scripture. But Claudia didn't live very long. She died. According to the stories told about her, Popea, she'd urged Nero to kill his mother, Agrippina, and to divorce and later murder his first wife, Octavia. She's also reported to have persuaded Nero to kill the philosopher Seneca. I'm going to stop right there. You remember who Seneca is? Paul and Seneca wrote letters back and forth that I read a couple of weeks ago to you. Seneca promised that as long as he was alive, nothing would become a Paul. Nothing would happen to him when persecution broke out. They were very good friends. I found something else out this week. When Paul goes before the governor, Gallio, in the book of Acts, Gallio is Seneca's brother. So another connection there with the empire, with the highest of people in the empire. And of course, as I mentioned before, Seneca was the tutor of Nero and later his advisor, whom Nero commanded finally to go kill himself. And when that happened, that's when the Neuronic persecutions broke out. And we read in those letters that Seneca had shared Paul's letters with Popea and with Nero. And Paul wrote back to him and said, this is not good. This is not good. This is not good. But Seneca assured him that they would look favorably on those letters. But in those letters, as you know, there are lists of Roman converts to this secret foreign superstition that was strictly illegal. You might speculate when Nero calls on the Christians to have them punished for burning Rome down in 64. He had some good lists to work with from Paul's letters that included senators, royal druids, secretaries of the empire, Seneca himself, probably Gallio, and maybe 50 more people there that he readily knew and could easily get. But Popeye 
also had a love for Judaism. This is what's really strange when it comes to the Popeia of Jerusalem and the Popeia of Rome, that when Josephus came to Rome to plead on the behalf of the Jews as the war was coming up in uh, 66, Popeia interceded on behalf of the Jews twice. The first time was to free the priests. What priests were left, the high priest with the exception of one were all killed in the massacre of Jerusalem. But there were a lot of other priests out there in the country that were put into slavery. So Je jo Josephus being a priest himself goes and stands in on their behalf for mercy before Nero. So we have Josephus meeting with Popeia, and you know, he was in the royals. Josephus was adopted by the next real emperor, Vespasian, and the Jews received many gifts from her during that time. In the second instance of her coming into a situation for good was a different delegation, and they won her influence in their cause to keep standing a wall at the temple that would keep the emperor from seeing the temple's proceedings. Well, actually, it wasn't the emperor that was looking. It was the king, King Agrippa. He built himself a palace. It was high enough that the high porch on the palace overlooked the temple, the part of the temple where they did sacrifices. So Agrippa would bring his friends and foreign dignitaries up to that place and watch the sacrifices. You see, there was a really strong contingency at that time that foreigners had no place in the worship of Elohim, and just to have them looking at sacrificing destroyed the sacrifices. They were of no effect because somebody supposedly so evil was looking on, and even heathens were looking on. So the zealots in the temple, they built a wall in the court so Agrippa and his friends could no longer watch the festivities that were going on during the sacrificial systems season. They built a wall to keep them up. And this is something that Popeia moved into to help keep the wall up. These are very strange coincidences. Not to mention that there are some records that say that Popeia was actually interested in that foreign superstition that her husband tried hard to stamp out. Tacitus also writes about her. In fact, we get our main source from him. He doesn't depict any kind acts, not the ones toward the Jews, but depicts her as corrupt. I love reading Tacitus, or Tacitus as I pronounce. I love listening to it at night. Tacitus and Cassius Dio, or Dio, is another historian of that time. I read one, listen to the other one at night. You think that stuff would be boring? It's not boring. It is not boring. It's not only interesting, but action-packed. Tacitus says that Popeia engineered her marriage with Otho, especially to get closer to, and eventually marry Nero. Who'd want to marry him? It's the power and the money. Tacitus does assert that she was quite beautiful, but shows how she used her beauty and sexuality as a way of gaining power and prestige. She was a real Jezebel, flirting with the Nazarene faith, interceding for Jew, a good Christian during the daytime, and a profligate seductress at night. All right, now it's time for speculation. And that's all this is, is speculation. You know how I feel about Paul. We need Paul. But also, it's our intention to put some meat on his bones. And to do that with the sparse information we have, sometimes we have to put a few dots to make all the dots form the body of Paul. Oh, Saul did everything in his power to win the attention and hopefully the love of beautiful Popeye. Again, let's connect him up with the temple priesthood and his desire to get letters there and a greater desire, perhaps, to stamp out the Nazarene movement on behalf of the Sadducees. Saul's exertions against the Nazarene, his bitter and zealous persecution of the earlier followers, often brought approval from Popeia, condescending affection, so we speculate, but his repeated offers of marriage were repeatedly spurned. A case of unrequited love. In this speculation, Paul really despised the Jew. If we read his letters in the scripture, we get that impression greatly. Not only Paul, but if we read the Gospel of John, it's highly charged with anti-Semitism. So is Romans. Paul despised that because she 
was Jewish, yet Nero was a Roman. They fell in love and married each other. That is Nero and Popea, and Paul is rejected completely. It's the third husband of Popea. Then Popea abruptly left Jerusalem to enter into a career on the stage in Rome. I can almost see this playing out in a motion picture. A girl coming from a rich but very highly devoted family to the ministry or to, or to the business, we'll say. But her desire to be in front, desire for the footlights, takes her away from the safe safety of home into the world and its corrupting influences. As actresses go, speculate that she graduated from being the high priest's daughter to becoming the mistress of Emperor Nero, who eventually made an honest woman out of her by marrying her and leaving Saul behind. That which was reported by Epiphanius, the account that he writes about the Ebionites' understanding of Paul. He's heartbroken. He's also enraged because this pours water on his plans. He's disconsolate, depressed, distraught, disheartened. He leaves Jerusalem and heads for the desert where, like a wounded lion, he licked his wounded heart, bleeding with sorrow. He went home. Paul traveled and stayed in Arabia three years, as we said before, but Paul was a resilient man and a brilliant man, and he was resourceful, a man of action. Remember, he wasn't satisfied to lay back and watch the Nazarenes overtake the established Jewish religion. And according to the Acts, that very well could have happened, leading to the death of Yahshua HaMashiach, James, and his brother Simon. Paul acted. He had three years to muse upon what he might do. If we want to take it a little farther, Paul's Christianity may have been the result of his love affair. Popea, which had failed. If he was a vindictive man, he could get them all back. Paul's conversion itself coincides with his being rejected by Popea. Same time. He must have been under considerable emotional and mental strain, especially if he indeed did see this vision on the road to Damascus. One question I've never been able to get anybody to answer. Was Paul riding a horse? It's possible that this crisis in his life had some bearing on this sudden change from being one of the greatest supporters of the Jewish law to one of its greatest enemies. As we read throughout Galatians, Paul then left Damascus and instead of seeking out the company of the other followers of Yahshua, he went into the Arabian desert to remain hidden for three years. Yes, it may well have been here that he had a vision or began to formulate his version or his own understanding of what Yahshua taught. This involved a rejection of the Jewish law. It had to if he's going to Europe in the end. He had no other choice, which in turn meant his turning away from the fact that throughout his life, Yahshua had remained a practicing Jew and always sought to uphold the teachings that Moses had brought before him. And we've already noted that every teaching of Yahshua was already in the literature of that day. We'll talk about that a little tomorrow afternoon as we get into the Jordan-led codices. Notice that Paul, I, I have to admit, the Christianity that we have today, he is the founder of because it follows Paul's ancient letters perfectly. And I know a lot of people vilify Paul for that, but what if he actually was sent for that purpose? He would have to abandon the Torah. Yet, as the writer of half the canonized New Testament, he never really quotes Yahshua in any of his letters or writings. I think the deepest thing he quotes is um, to do good, or that's about all I can think of. Did Paul avenge himself by creating a new religion? Nothing like this had ever been before. Paul was perhaps born a Gentile in a town that was not only heavily influenced by mystic cults and gods such as Atis, Adonis, Mithras, Osiris, and Baal Taraz, but was actually named after one of those, ba Baal Taraz, Tarsus, also found in Tarsus were Jews who were called God-fearers because they accepted the teachings of Judaism but were unwilling to be circumcised or adopt to all the food ordinances of Judaism or the feast. God-fearers. Acts of the Apostles talks about <clears throat> Paul was either born to a God-fearing parent or he converted as a young man and he headed for Jerusalem, 
according to the Ebionites, to study with a view of becoming a Pharisee, which was most highly respected Jewish philosophers, or maybe even a priest. Why does he go to Caiaphas if he wants to be a Pharisee? It would be like me wanting to be a Messianic leader and going to the Presbyterian church to learn how. His early childhood influences included much exposure to pagan gods. Tarsus is a real Greek city, though it's in Turkey. Tarsus maintained a huge pride about being completely Hellenized. And in Zeeland, Michigan, you can drive down one street and up the other, and you'll find two or three churches on each street, all the same denomination, all split up. 151 churches of one denomination in that little town. It must have been a lot like that in Tarsus. It was a melting pot there on the coast of Anatolia of people that came. It's also a very wealthy city. There is another uh, theory uh, brought down by Eusebius that Paul was born in Samaria or in Galilee. And during one of the persecutions of earlier times, his family had to move up to Tarsus because that was going on in his childhood time as well. Rome moving them around, spreading them out. Having failed to make the grade as a Pharisee, maybe, he was bright, but he lacked the logic ability required, which is demonstrated in his theology that we have, especially in Romans, more contradictions, so hard to understand. However, if we were reading it in the language he wrote it in, we probably could understand. We would see his genius. It just doesn't pour into English that way. After the death of Yahshua, maybe he was sent to kidnap some of Yahshua's followers who fled to Damascus and returned them to the high priest for punishment. The indication is there for that. Investigating these followers of Yahshua, all saw a lot in the idea of a resurrection, a resurrection that was in common with the myths that he'd grown up with. All that those cults dealt with a resurrection, but not a bodily resurrection, a spiritual resurrection, whereas the Gospels teach a bodily resurrection. Paul has nothing to do with that. For him, it's a spiritual resurrection. Having failed to reach his goal in becoming a Pharisee, having failed to reach his goal of marrying Popea, and having been reduced to the role of a thug, according to Josephus, for quizzling Roman collaborator. Paul may be cracked. He experienced a breakdown of some sort, with, which left him with a basis of ideas that became what we know as Christianity today. He may have dressed up Yahshua in the clothes of Atis, Adonis, Mithras, Osiris, Baal Taraz, and it may be his own divinity, as he said, Christ lives in me, and set out to finally become the important man that his ego required and that had brought him to Jerusalem in the first place. Was Paul's goal? to gain support through the destruction of the Nazarenes? Is there a connection between Popea, the daughter of Caiaphas, and Popea, the God-fearing wife of Otho and Nero? Well, I think if we delved a little deeper, we could make a pretty strong circumstantial case. Historical evidences and sources maintain that Popea continued to practice a sectarian form of Judaism, which was probably the Ebionite Judaism or the Nazarene Judaism that had been become so popular in the mid-first century. It's also noted in sources that Nero's love for the actress Popea, who was married to Nero's exiled friend Otho, whom Nero sent into exile in Portugal, was the reason Nero did away with his first wife, Octavia, to marry his friend's wife. It was a setup. Secondly, perhaps Saul would lure away the pagan from their traditional worship of emperors of Augusti, Augustus, the one who had dared to possess the body of his believed, uh, beloved Popea, and leave the emperor without an empire. Could he have brought down Rome with his connections? Quite possible. Luring away the pagan worshippers from their deified Emperor Christ to a godlike Christ would torpedo the emperor's love for glorification. The hero worship would be transferred from the Augustus to the Christus. That would leave an emperor a mere shell for Nero to go after this foreign superstition and have thousands upon thousands and thousands more killed would indicate to me a threat, and Nero dealt with threats quickly and decisively. Paul could have killed two birds with one stone. He could have taken care of 
traditional Judaism and taking care of the Roman Empire at the same time. Maybe he came up with a strategy there in Arabia in his imposed exile. Again, this sounds really like I am exaggerating. But if you know who Paul names in his books, again, and if you make connections, he had power. Did Paul deceptively start working from within the Nazarene movement to destroy them? Acts 24, 5. For we have found this man a plague, one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world, and is ringleader of the heresy of the Nazarenes stirs up riots all over the world? Isn't this exactly what Josephus said concerning Paul and Bar Costas? Oh, I mean Barnab, I mean Noah Costabarus. The scholar Maurice Bucale says, it's quite reasonable to ask what Christianity might have been without Paul. And one could no doubt construct all sorts of hypotheses on this subject, but Christianity probably would never have existed if it hadn't been for Paul. Would we be better off or less better off? One answer that seems obvious to me, if Popea, if this if this speculation has any truth to it, if Popea had only accepted Paul's offer of marriage, would Christianity exist today? That's the end of the speculation. People still here. Let's see what the chat says. Quo Vadis. Links to ta ta yeah, so I would suggest if you want Tacitus, Tacitus, go out to LibriVox.org. Yes, somebody got it here. You can download those books and listen to them for free. I love reading them too. They're full of action, full of uh, historical markers and people. Samson during the day and Delilah at night. That doesn't sound too good. It's like Paul during the day and Popea at night. Well, my mind's in the gutter, I guess. Well, thank you for the compliment of connecting these dots. However, however, it still seems pretty far-fetched, but there are dots there. And again, it's our intention to enflesh Paul a little bit. Paul is, is not perfect. Paul is not God or a God. He's not. But my concern today is Yahshua Moshiach is lost on today's church. The only place it seems that he is retained is through the Eucharist. And still, even at that, the Eucharist that's used is straight out of Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 7 to 10. Whoa, whoa. Allison, do you Allison still like me? I promise the next one I do, it'll be all about Paul and the apotheosis of Paul as he ascends. You know, I do these on the good Paul does, and this certified cognitive pneumatology course is completely consistent in Paul because of his observations, they're right on. They're right on. You know how old holy I am, right? Well, I stole a Tootsie Roll once. Yes, I did. And then I lied to my mother. I didn't steal the Tootsie Roll. The guy gave it. I still feel guilty for that. But think, today I could be a thief, robbing banks, going about breathing murderous threats. So could you. Would things have been different if we changed one little thing? Would our world be different if Paul had not been there? Here's my conclusion on that. If Paul hadn't been there, this world would be lost or gone by now. And that's a fact. <laughs> Thank you for coming out. Appreciate it. Maybe I'll see you tomorrow. We got two services in the uh, lead codices. Love you. Sure do. Especially you, Norman. Is that all there is? No, that's not all there is. Join us tomorrow night for more Jackson Snyder. Presents. Presents. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>